saving, as I said, is not enough. You have to put your money into assets that are going to at least keep up with the inflation that you're seeing and the rise in cost uh, for your day-to-day -day expenses. This conflation between investing and saving, I think is really the key to helping the FIRE community understand that Bitcoin is actually a better vehicle for doing that than the stock market index. That's what the FIRE movement is about, is getting you to that place as, as quickly and as early on in life where you have these opportunities and options that you don't have if you if you don't yet have that financial independence. You are one of the interesting guests that went from that uh, banking fiat world uh, into the the new area of, of Bitcoin, the new uh, area uh, that we are kind of all into. Um, before we start into the whole topics with fire and self-custody that I want to get into, um, maybe let's quickly, why did you went into Bitcoin, uh, especially with Goldman Sachs, Deloitte, really big companies, you probably had a, a really good job there. And then just transitioning into Bitcoin, it's a big step. Uh, and uh, why did you do that? And what's what it's like? Did you have had any difficulties, any challenges uh, during that time? Yeah, I um, I think in a lot of ways, Bitcoin came before my career in um, in finance, although it was from the roots of the libertarian movement that I kind of came up in and my thought process around the time that the financial crisis hit in 2008. So I started kind of getting into the uh, sound money principles and libertarianism and, um, you know, anarcho-capitalism and like all of those thought processes that dovetail very well with the way that Bitcoin exists in the world and the kind of principles that un uh, underlie it. And so I was very much primed to be receptive to Bitcoin when it started to come across my radar in, in maybe 2011. Uh, at the time, I was working for Goldman Sachs, and my my background is is pretty broad around consulting and finance and banking, um, sales and um, and technology, and so like all of those different disciplines obviously have a lot in common with Bitcoin and and the message that it kind of portrays to the world. I guess Bitcoin doesn't really have a message, so to speak, but those messages kind of come out of the ether of what it is and how it operates and the incentive structure that's at play there. And, um, you know, so although I didn't like really start to get Bitcoin until much later in, in my journey, it was kind of just there underneath the, the surface, um, lurking as a part of this framework of understanding or framework of thought that, um, I had been developing, uh, from kind of the political side of things. And, um, no, I'd always been kind of fascinated by banking and the stock market and investing and that kind of thing. And that's what led me to the path of going um, with my career toward working at the likes of, well, Deloitte consulting in the technology practice, but then focusing on financial services and banking. Um, then I spent three years at Goldman Sachs. Um, I spent a year and a half at MetLife. Um, doing some internal management consulting and, and helping people improve the way they work. Um, and then came back into banking uh, more on the capital market side um, and, and spent about six years at SunTrust, which became Truist as part of a merger with BBMT. Uh, and, and Truist is right now the, the sixth largest bank um, in, in the US. Um, so pretty powerful position there. And I spent my days mostly on the trading floor doing risk and PL analysis for the capital markets trading desks. Um, so I really like that analytical framework, um, trade flows and um, working with different people across the life cycle of a trade and the operational side of things. Um, and it was, so I, I first bought Bitcoin around 2014. And then around 2018, 2019 is where I really started to get it. <clears throat> Um, and I started, you know, more dollar cost averaging. I found the financial independence retire early framework around that same time as well. Um, and so I, I just like, for whatever reason, it took me that long to find the right people and to really take the time to dig into Bitcoin and, and really start to understand it and why it had value and why I should pay attention to it and why I should allocate more capital to it. Um, and so then leading into uh, late 2019, 2020, I, I kind of 
saw the writing on the wall for what would be coming after the having and this bull market that we all expected, which turned out to, to actually come to fruition. And I put together a deck within my uh, presentation within my um, you know banking job called Bitcoin for Bankers. Um, I was expecting that as that bull market played out, that people around me would just have questions about it. They'd be interested to learn. And so I thought, you know, who better than me, who has taken the time to understand this, does own some already, has some deep conviction to be able to answer their questions. And I approached that presentation along the lines of like, okay, well, why should you care? You should care because your clients are going to care. They're going to start asking you questions and you you don't want to look like an idiot, right? Like you want to have some kind of intelligent responses to these questions that they're going to be asking you. Uh, so let me give you the foundation of what that should look like and be there to, to answer some questions for you. And that was pretty popular as things were really heating up in 2020 and 2021. Um, and that led to an opportunity to join uh, what the bank called a crypto working group in 2021 where the board of direct directors for Truist, this massive bank, was starting to ask questions about the broader landscape. Um, should they be involved? What should the strategy be, if anything? Like, let's just get a foundational understanding there. And so I was asked to join this working group as the Bitcoin subject matter expert. And, um, you know, I was. Uh, honored and, and privileged enough to provide my perspective on why they should be focusing on Bitcoin and Bitcoin alone, Bitcoin first at the very least, um, why NFTs and DeFi and all of this other stuff that was going on at that time was something that they should spend zero time thinking about. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these people come from very much steeped in the traditional finance background. Uh, they don't really get it. They don't really get Bitcoin. It certainly didn't then. Um, but it was nice to be in a position where I could express those views that they never would have gotten if I hadn't been in that seat. Um, and so I'd like to think that that I helped move their thought process forward as part of that. And it was a really great experience for me to you know, get exposure to these people, help them hopefully improve the way that they were thinking about Bitcoin um, as an asset, as a money, and how it might ultimately affect banking in the future as we as we move forward and as Bitcoin gains adoption. And then from there, I, I started just getting itchy. You know, I wanted to move on from from banking, if at all possible, and actually work in the space. Um, and I found an opportunity with Unchained and I've been here almost three years now. Uh, so it's it's been an incredible journey. Uh, I love the team over here. They're absolutely like top notch, incredible intellectual people driven like we all have this common mission and purpose around Bitcoin and helping people to take control of their wealth, um, you know, using self custody uh, methodology that that has inheritance planning, succession planning in in at the forefront of the way that we approach it, um, and then providing other financial services around making the transition from a fiat de denominated world to a Bitcoin denominated world. Um, there's a long transition there, I think, right? And there are a lot of tools that people need to be able to uh, kind of straddle both of those worlds until Bitcoin becomes global money. Uh, at which point, you know, the, 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 the mission of Unchained will evolve, I imagine. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see how that plays out. Uh, that's really interesting. And, and you're one of the best guests probably here to, to ask the question. <clears throat> and I have this question a lot of times in, uh, in my podcast, I have this a lot of times in, in, in my head. Um, we have banks now. And uh, if you want to be your own bank in Bitcoin, you have to have, you have to get your own keys. You have to kind of hold your own keys. Yeah. Uh, but even in the Bitcoin community right now, not too many people uh, take advantage of that opportunity. I'm always surprised when I go out of my Bitcoin <laughs> core group, in my friend group where there are also a lot of Bitcoiners, almost nobody has their own keys. And if they have their own keys, I'm a little bit disappointed with their setup. And I'm always <laughs> trying to push them a little harder to like something multi-signature, something a little bit more secure, uh, not being vulnerable if, if uh, yeah, something happens. So I'm, 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 I'm genuinely uh, dissatisfied with most people's self-custody situation and most people don't even have it. Um, so I, I would imagine most of those people are still kind of new to Bitcoin. Like it took me a while 
to start to actually get up the learning curve enough where I understood that that was even something that I should be thinking about at all. And then thinking about how I should be doing it. <laughs> and then thinking about like all of the trade-offs that are associated with it and um, and then really understanding how it worked and, and then taking that next step, which took a little while because you're really afraid that you're going to mess it up. You know, uh, I hear these stories from people all the time who are relatively new to Bitcoin. They, they, you know, right now, the default way to get exposure to Bitcoin is very different than it was 10 years ago when like you basically had to hold your own keys. Uh, there weren't all of these other options out there for getting exposure to the price without doing that. And so it was much more natural for, for people who were actually that actively in interested in Bitcoin to just go straight to holding keys because there was no other way. Uh, but now there's a million different options for how you can get exposure to the price. And, and let's be honest, exposure to the price is the number one reason why people adopt Bitcoin at first right? It is absolutely the number one. It's going to continue to be the number one reason. And, you know, that's not a bad thing, uh, but it is something that just highlights the need for an evolution in people's thought process. And one that you with your podcast and Unchained with the content that we put out and so many other people are working on is to just make sure that the content and the education is in place so that when people are ready to take that next step, that there's an easy path to make it happen, that the tools are available for them to make it happen, and that they have a lower chance of foot gunning when they take the step, which would cause them potentially to just like completely turn off to Bitcoin. Um, you know, if something devastating like that were to happen, they were to lose a lot of their wealth that they've accumulated in, in Bitcoin terms. Uh, so all of this stuff is really important, but I think, you know, I, I wouldn't be overly discouraged there, I guess is the point, right? Like. These things take take time. A lot of people are going to buy the Bitcoin ETF and then they're going to, you know, some subset of them are going to go down the rabbit hole and realize why they should be thinking about self-custody, thinking about the sovereignty that it brings, thinking about all the other benefits that you get from holding Bitcoin directly and, and controlling the keys to your wealth there. Um, and that subset will go on. And our job is just to make sure that the path is very clear to them and how to do it. And the tools are very clear very, um, you know, are robust enough to make it easy for them. Yeah, that's this kind of answers my question a little bit already uh, that I wanted to go in the direction. Um, so you think that there's an, like just an education curve when we think back in the early internet days, nobody knew how to send an email. Now sending email, sending WhatsApp, sending all those messages, it's really easy and almost everybody understands that that operated the phone. Um, so you think that holding your own keys having self custody will be a normal thing that almost everybody does like just now sending WhatsApp messages and sending emails. Or I, I don't know be... that it will be normal. I, I think the email analogy is really interesting because I think there was a time when people expected that it would be easy for people to run their own email servers, which in my mind is much more akin to what we're talking about here with self custody. And that is absolutely not the case, right? It's very difficult to run your own email server. And there's all kinds of network effect around Google and, um, you know, the other major email providers that are out there that almost prevents you from being able to effectively run your own email server and get your messages through, <laughs> you know? Um, and so, so I don't know that it will ever be the dominant way that people own Bitcoin. And to some degree, it's very difficult for that to happen anyway, just with the construct of the way that Bitcoin is designed. You know, um, I, I think I'm 100% optimistic about us being able to expand the ability for people to uh, control their own UTXOs, control their own keys in a scalable way. But that doesn't mean that it can scale necessarily to 8 billion people or 10 billion people or 20 billion people, which is probably the projection that we that we get to in the 50 years time uh, on the globe. So I think those trade offs have to be there. And there's a uh, there's an order of operations, of course, but then there's a set of trade offs that we as a society need to make sure that we understand that like you want to get as far down the stack as you can. And uh, but it's not necessarily going to be achievable for everybody, nor should it necessarily be achievable 
if you're just dealing with small amounts of money, like it's okay to use a custodian and, and all that, if you are only dealing in small amounts of money, I think, um, there's a lot of tools that are being built around like eCash and Fediments and all that stuff that I think are going to bridge this gap quite a bit. And it's going to be really interesting to see how we evolve on the scalability side. Um, it, it's weird to say, cause for a while I thought that like, oh yeah, we, we kind of have solved this problem with lightning and, and everything in terms of scalability and allowing people to, to use Bitcoin like that for like day-to-day -day purposes. But, um, I'm, I've kind of like had a reality check there, I think in my own use of lightning and, and just how difficult it is to, to actually like scale up to everyday payments. Um, and I think, you know, that that's like, we need to continue to work, to build those tools, to make that available to everybody. But that doesn't mean that it's going to be a hundred percent penetration, uh, nor should it be. Yeah. And I had a podcast with Wicked uh, from Twitter, who, who's doing a lot of new TXO management. And uh, he kind of come to the conclusion that there will be a maximum of maybe 5 million, maybe 10 million, maybe 15 million people, institutions, whatever, are uh, being able to transact base layer Bitcoin on a monthly basis, uh, because it will be just really expensive. Uh, and the rest of it will be on, on layer two, layer three, on, on, on Fediment, on whatever will be built there. Uh, uh, and uh, this, will, this is really interesting. But... Even on second layers, you kind of have the possibility to maybe have self custody on a second layer or have a bank on on a thing. Uh, but it will be interesting to see where where banks end up uh, end up being in the in the Bitcoin world. I think also the lending and stuff like that will always be the case. There will always be, be people that lend to other people to to make something or to invest something or something like that. So the banking yeah. world is not like some Bitcoiners say completely gone. <laughs> uh, yeah. But it well, you, you said different. you use the phrase be your own bank. And that's a great catchphrase, right? But in reality, that's not possible. Um, because a bank does way more than just hold your money. Um, they lend, and they put deals together, bringing capital together to allocate resources across different investments. Um, and, and matching buyers and sellers and, and all this stuff, right? They, they are kind of like a broker for all of this economic activity and they're taking in deposits from people and, and storing their money, which we all know is, is not really there, but, um, you know, that's only one small function of a bank. So you can be your own bank to that little tiny slice of what they're doing, but, um, you know, actually performing all the functions of banking that are very beneficial for society as we, uh, figure out how to allocate capital and and scale that capital allocation across across the global economy. Um, that stuff is still going to have a place for banks. Now, what do banks look like? Are they going to be much smaller in scale in, on a Bitcoin standard? Um, I would like to think so. I, I think that's probably true. Um, it, it's I think just generally harder to get to massive scale when you have global sound money because um, the, the, the fiat system kind of incentivizes growing companies massively. Um, whereas sound money encourages more decentralization of the economy and more localization of the economy. Um, it, it's, it's harder to have a massive conglomerate that lasts for a hundred years on uh, a Bitcoin standard because you don't have this like cheap financing available necessarily. You will have cheaper financing as a, as a major company, um, but you, you don't have the ability to access kind of artificially cheap money in the markets that's being paid for at the expense of the rest of the economy um, because this new money just can't be printed at will and into perpetuity the way that it can now, right? So um, I, I think like the structure of banking uh, may look much more like the wildcat, um, you know, generation of banks. And I, I think that would absolutely be beneficial and good, um, but banking is definitely not gonna go away. Um, it, it serves a very important function in the economy. Yeah, I, I like that, uh, that that view. It's, it's more realistic and more, uh, as I think it will actually happen. And even if, if, if banks get a really small role, we have a long way to go there. Like it's, it's not something that will, will happen overnight. And 
definitely is not something that we even want to happen overnight uh, because it's like with, when the fiat system uh, crashes down too fast, this has massive implications on, on the well-beings of, of our loved yeah. ones that might not be uh, as far but yeah it's it's uh, i like to i'm really interested to see i'm really interested to see how how the banks fall in terms of like the timeline of them adopting bitcoin and what that looks like Uh, part of me thinks well they'll probably be the last to adopt bitcoin because it kind of is direct competition for a lot of what they do and uh you know they have this favored position within the government that allows them to print money alongside the government, right? And um, why would you ever want to give that up and start adopting Bitcoin and, and all that? But on the other hand, it feels like there's so much opportunity for them because they're in that favored position to be able to like dominate the world of credit that's built on top of Bitcoin. Bitcoin-backed lending is something that Unchained has done since um, our, our founding, right? And um, you know, the the capital that we're able to source is not all that cheap for this because Wall Street doesn't understand Bitcoin. We're just starting to get there. Um, but as soon as the banks come into this, they're going to be able to really drive down lending rates for Bitcoin backed loans and uh, mature that industry and that approach to finance around Bitcoin in a, a much, a much better way, I think. And it will allow people to get much more reach in terms of credit. Um, And the banks are going to benefit from this because again, they still have sit in this favored position where they can print money to fund loans and then take that collateral in in case something were to go wrong. Uh, So I I think that is inevitable that they, that they do come into this, but I, I'm not sure what the timeframe of that acceptance or adoption actually looks like i mean small uh, banks already in there Um, we have a german bank that is really active in the bitcoin community they have even like a bit bitcoin conference in the german speaking area with like over thousand uh, participants like they're really big on bitcoin but it's just a local bank in germany that they have some bitcoiners in their own they they do it but not on a massive scale yeah Mm -hmm. um last question on on that banking uh, intersection with, with bitcoin and you how different have you have you noticed any difference between working in that fiat banking world and working for Unchained, a uh, yeah, Bitcoin company? Oh well, <laughs> yes. Um, all of the other companies that I worked for before Unchained were big corporations, right? They're they're have thousands, tens of thousands of people working for them, um, very long histories and all of that. And Unchained is. Well, when I joined was basically still just a startup. Um, we had just closed a series A. Uh, right now we've, we've, you know, uh, closed a series B last year. So, you know, a little bit more mature, we're bigger uh, and all that, but it's still very much a growth company. And so just the, the difference in um, approach or uh, maturity of a company and what is built and how the processes work and, and all that is, is very different. So that, but that's natural with any kind of like bigger company versus a smaller company or a startup. Um, but in terms of the culture that's built into, you know, the fiat banking world versus Bitcoin, it's also obviously drastically different, right? Like we take a low time preference view on everything. Um, everything is built with as much, um, ownership in mind for us and our processes and the way that we want to build tools to not create any single points of failure with any of the other like interconnections that we might have with other companies or other providers of services there. And so to the extent that we can mitigate that, we want to, because we think of ourselves as being here, okay, we're going to be here a hundred years. We are going to continue to be uh, a pioneer and at the forefront of Bitcoin adoption when it comes to custody and um, Bitcoin integrated financial services. And in order to do that, we need to make sure that we own the infrastructure uh, as much as possible so that if something were to happen, um, you know, in the wider industry, we've seen some issues with this, um, with, with other companies in the space, and we don't want to be in that position, right? So uh, a lot of that involves, um, you know, approaching the the regulatory framework in a very different way. A lot of that uh, involves approaching the product development roadmap in a very different way. And it's kind of like slow and steady wins the race. 
um, but we're going to be in a position where our clients can be very sure um, that we're not going anywhere and that the key services that they depend on, that they are using, that they love so much from us are not going to be affected there. And this, this low time preference and, you know, century plus view of, of our business and of Bitcoin and how that integrates is it, just permeated throughout the culture. Um, and so, as I said, like we have an unbelievably talented team over here. Like I uh, am so lucky to be working with these people uh, every single day. I'm like blown away by how you know smart these people are, and I'm just glad that I get to be around those uh, that that thought process and that way of uh, approaching it. Um, and I've grown tremendously in the way that I think about things as as a as a result of that. Yeah, it's fascinating to see. Even I interviewed a lot of people that came from the fiat world, but are now in the, in the, in the Bitcoin world, especially those who already have experience in the fiat world. I mean, I myself was also six years before in, in IT security it has nothing to do with Bitcoin or fiat, but it's, 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 uh, not Bitcoin company, uh, but six years is not that long. And some other people have like been 10, 20 years, even longer than that, uh, being in fiat and then switched to Bitcoin and it's kind of kind of the same thing as what you described what uh what i see uh the actual topic yeah, I, th I think to... i think a lot of the the fiat culture drives like this lack of wanting to be responsible for any kind of decision which leads to just stagnation and um and it's just this constant like cover your ass mentality um i don't want to be the guy who made the wrong decision about doing anything at all on a daily basis that would come back to bite me and lose my, you know, great benefits and all that kind of thing. And so, you know, there's this like lack of ownership in the business and lack of responsibility that people are taking in the fiat world. Um, they don't care at all about the business. There's no, there's no passion there. I mean, now granted, like I work at a Bitcoin company and Bitcoin is my passion. So I'm very lucky in that, in that regard that I get to focus on something that I absolutely love every single day. But that doesn't mean that you can't replicate that type of ownership feeling in the business that you work for. Um, but that typically happens when it's much more localized, smaller businesses. And, and the further away you get from like the fiat spigot, I think the the more you're going to get from that, um, and we see a lot of that in like local businesses and small businesses um, than you do in these big corporate behemoths. It's actually the, the one word ownership is actually the uh, when I get asked like what's the main thing you get away from all the interviews? It's like ownership. That that that's the thing. Like ownership, you can get it with Bitcoin. You can get it with all the life lessons uh, that we learned in the in the podcast. That's the one. Uh, were the one uh, thing that I always get away from from, from Bitcoin. Um, but let's move on to the to the next topic uh, that I actually wanted to get in uh, earlier, but it's uh, it's about fire, uh, not fire, the, the one that burns, but the fire, financial independence and retire early. Uh, it's fascinating, the community, and it was a community that I was also in before Bitcoin. Uh, and I had some already two podcasts around that topic. Uh, and, and people are really, really uh, looking for, uh, out for those videos and, and seeing how Bitcoin can be part of the fire community or how Bitcoin is actually the foundation of <laughs> financial independence and, and retiring earlier than, than, than in a fiat uh, world. Um, explain to us like why is Bitcoin maybe the, the best vehicle to, to retire on or, or why, why Bitcoin is, is perfect for the FIRE community also? Yeah, well, um, the, the FIRE community intuitively understands why Bitcoin is so needed and the problem that it solves. But they approach it in a different way because they haven't done the work of, of understanding what Bitcoin is and why it actually solves the problem that they're trying to solve with the tools that they're using. You know, the, the nature of money itself is something that they intuitively understand that we have this credit-based money that will constantly be debased that you can't just sit on cash, right? If you sit on cash, you're destined to lose purchasing power over time. And so you, and, and that causes life to get more expensive over time, right? Everybody sees this. Everybody knows that if you sit on cash over a 30 year period and save that, uh, and then try to pay for your kids college, you're not going to get there, right? Like those, those points will never meet. <laughs> um, same thing for healthcare, same thing for education. 
Um, anything that the government is very heavily involved with is going to grow uh, in cost at a, a faster rate than things that they're not, um, which is why you know we see TVs and, and electronics and stuff that has very little government involvement in, uh, you know, does get cheaper over time, um, at least in real purchasing power. But these other things will, they're, they're very much necessary and they are always going to get more expensive. And, and, and then saving, as I said, is not enough. You have to invest your money or you have to put your money into assets that are going to at least keep up with the inflation that you're seeing and the rise in purchasing or uh, in cost uh, for your day-to-day -day expenses. And so the way that the FIRE community approaches this typically is to say, okay, we're going to buy the stock market. And this is very US centric, by the way. So I, I can get into that a little bit more, but the US stock market has this long history of, of beating inflation, of going up and, and providing this compounding effect that allows you to develop a portfolio of assets that you can use to fund your retirement. And if you start early enough, and if you save hard enough and invest that money hard enough uh, and quickly enough early on in life, you can retire early. Like you can get to a point where you're 35 or 40 and you've got $3 million in the bank. Um, and by in the bank, I mean invested in these liquid assets that you can start to draw down on. And that $3 million will at least hold you over for the next 30 years. Uh, and most likely you're going to end up with way more than what you started with because of this compounding effect. Um, and the benefits that have been derived from the fact that the U.S. has just been the leader in the world in terms of productivity and um, growth, uh, this growth engine that that manifests in terms of the stock market. And so the idea is, OK, I'm going to save um, you know, as much as I can. I'm going to spend less than I make, save the rest, invest it in, in the stock market. But I'm not going to pick stocks necessarily. I'm going to buy the entire market. Right? I'm going to buy the whole index so that I don't have to worry about timing it. I don't have to worry about the fate of an individual company. I'm just going to plow as much money as quickly as I can into the total stock market index. And then I'm going to wait until I hit my number, this number that I've uh, calculated based on the expenses that I expect to have. And when I hit that number, I can retire. I don't have to go through this like drudgery of being in the fiat world and working those jobs that we were talking about, uh, where everybody's just trying to cover their ass and you want to get out there as, as quickly as possible and you don't have any ownership there. Um, and this is very much the mentality that I had before that like 2018, 2019 timeframe when I, when I really started to understand Bitcoin. Um, this is absolutely the mentality that I had. And I, I found the fire movement trying to scratch that itch that I had to say like, I'm tired of coming into work every day and not being fulfilled. And I want to just like get out of here as quickly as possible so that I can go play golf on a daily basis and just do the things that I enjoy and, and not have so much time and energy wrapped up in this place that I just don't care about. Right. Um, and so by doing that, it works because of that compounding effect. Although the rest of the world doesn't necessarily have access to the US stock market. So that's one downside of this approach to, to fire. And one thing that Bitcoin has an advantage over it is that it's available everywhere. Um, you can buy a fraction of a Bitcoin, just like you can buy a fraction of the stock market index, but you can do that anywhere in the world uh, because it's available everywhere in the world. Um, and so Bitcoin really takes this approach to a whole different level. And the reason is because there's a difference in framing and there's a difference in thought process here that the fire movement doesn't quite get. And that is that what you're doing when you take this money that you have not spent, that you are saving and you are plowing it into the stock market index, that is not actually investing. That is saving. You are saving money in a vehicle that allows you to not lose purchasing power over time. Uh, but actually gains purchasing power over time. This conflation between investing and saving, I think, is really the key to helping the FIRE community understand that Bitcoin is actually a better vehicle for doing that than the stock market index. When you are investing, 
you are analyzing a particular venture, a particular company, and you're looking at their capital structure, you're looking at their debt to equity, you're looking at their revenue product projections, you're looking at the competition that surrounds them, and you're saying, okay, I'm going to take a bet that this company is going to outperform relative to uh, the 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 index, right? Because why would you buy an individual company if it's if you don't think it's going to outperform the index? And um, and I'm going to do all this analytical work to make sure that I'm allocating that capital appropriately. Because if if I'm not willing to do that work, then you might as well just buy the the index. But that's not investing, right? Investing is taking a an intentional look at a particular venture and allocating capital to that with the expectation that you're going to end up with more capital at the end of that um, relative to just holding cash or investing in the index. If you are just investing in the index and you've got exposure to the entire list of companies that are public, you have exposure to the entire economy essentially, which is the exact same thing that you get if you hold money. You have exposure to the entire economy, assuming that that money is fixed in supply. Well, Bitcoin happens to be fixed in supply. So now you can get access to the growth in the entire economy, not just in the US, but globally. And you can do that in this vehicle that cannot be debased, that cannot be inflated away, um, that will very likely grow much more quickly than the stock market. Even if you do have access to the US stock market, you're lucky enough to be one of those people in the world who do. Um, Bitcoin is going to grow faster than that because of its perfectly fixed supply and the fact that it's still so small. Um, so right now is like such an unbelievably opportune time to be um, kind of redirecting the savings that you have or that you're accumulating over the, the current time frame of your working life and putting that into an asset that is perfectly designed for the exact use case that you're using the stock market index for that has all these other drawbacks um, that we that we we're kind of talking about that is not available everywhere um, and that you know it, it still is kind of debased over time because there's there's more new companies coming in some of them are failing some of them are not um, you still have the same like kind of volatility that's associated with Bitcoin um, you might as well just go straight to the the base layer of getting access to the growth in the global economy as opposed to taking all this other like counterparty risk and and risk of owning stocks more generally if you are listening to this podcast you might be wondering what is actually the setup look like of robin or how can i improve my bitcoin setup and there's two things you have to buy bitcoin from the right source and you have to store bitcoin the right way let's focus on the first thing how to buy Bitcoin. It's simple. Have a Bitcoin only exchange. Don't deal with the shitcoin exchanges. Don't deal with an exchange that has an own token or something like that. Be on a Bitcoin only exchange. I use 21 Bitcoin. 21 Bitcoin is for me the best partner for that. And now where do you store Bitcoin? Bitcoin should be stored on a hardware wallet, on a self custody solution where you yourself hold your keys and it should be a cold wallet. So that's my simple solutions. That's a bit box. You just put your Bitcoin on there, back up your seed phrase, and you are better than 95% of all Bitcoin hodlers. If you have more than a thousand euros in Bitcoin, it's an absolutely must have. One last thing before we get back to the video. I'm really passionate about meeting other Bitcoiners. And there's an amazing opportunity in middle of Europe in June, the Bitcoin Prague conference. It's the best and biggest Bitcoin only conference in the whole of Europe. For all Americans, please visit Europe and visit this place in June. For all Europe's, it's a must go anyways. You are so close to the Bitcoin Prague conference, you basically have to come. I will do interviews there and I would love to meet you all there. Use code ROBIN for all my sponsors to get discounts and use the links down in the description. It gets interesting for me because I was a really big stock investor before like I did all the analysis, uh, analysis and I stayed up late till 1, 2 a.m. so I can listen to the American conference calls uh, on the other side of the world. Uh, and I did this whole game and I was quite successful with it. Uh, Great. It was, it was also exhausting for me. Uh, yeah. And then kind of in 2021, I adopted the full Bitcoin standard. And since then, 
I only invest in something that I know will outperform Bitcoin in the next 10 years. And the only two things that I found till now, this will change when, when Bitcoin gets more and more adopted. The only two things is right now my own knowledge uh, and my own kind of company with, with the podcast and everything that I'm starting now. Uh, but everything else is in Bitcoin. When I ask myself the question, is that company outperforming Bitcoin over the next 10 years? Uh, or is it maybe even around that in 10 years, that company, because there's competition, there's other things involved in that. Uh, I cannot think of, uh, of any company. This will change over time when Bitcoin gets to a uh, more mature state, then probably I get more and more in, back in, in stock investing because it gets more interesting enough, uh, uh, then, but this is an interesting topic because right now for me, it's just saving pension planning, <laughs> retiring early. Everything is just on Bitcoin right now. I mean, I'm 25. I'm also have. Like if I'm ending up tomorrow with zero capital, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm just as every other 25 year old uh, kind of, but that's an interesting thing in retiring early and, and, and Bitcoin. I have one uh, question for you on that topic. I researched before my podcast uh, started with you. What's the average age of, of my viewers on, on this podcast? Uh, and I came to know that the average age is actually 43, which was higher than expected because I'm so young. But uh, apparently mm -hmm. the 43 is the average range of, of, of age of, of, of my guest. Uh, so assuming if, if you want to, if you're now 43 and you want to retire with like 50s or a little bit earlier than usual with like 60, 65, conservatively thought, what, what do you think is the, if you have now zero Bitcoin and you want to retire at, at 50, what, what amount of Bitcoin should someone save for in like seven years? To I mean, there's an impossible <laughs> to answer question, mm. uh, but I'm curious about your thoughts on, on how much Bitcoin you need, uh, the retiring, what, what, yeah. what should people aiming for? So. Obviously, everybody's different, it's not financial advice, like all the normal disclaimers there. Um, the way that I think about this is there's one of two ways to do this. The first is you always have to start with what do you want your life to look like when you actually retire? And what does your expense profile look like in that vision of what you've got for your retirement um, or the next phase in your life, right? Like for me, I don't plan on retiring anytime soon. Um, in the traditional sense where it's like, okay, I just stop working and then go play golf. That's what I wanted to do when I was working in the fiat world. But now I'm lucky enough again to, to work in Bitcoin and, and work on something that I'm passionate about. So I'm not, I'm not going to never have an income stream and, and do all that, right? Like I'll get to a place where I can step back and not necessarily have like a full schedule every day and I can control my time a little bit more. Um, but, um, but I'm always going to be working. So that allows me to actually have a smaller number that I would need to get to. Um, but I don't think of it that way. I assume that I'm not going to be working because who knows what, what might happen to my health or something like that. And um, you can either use like the tr traditional 4% rule where essentially what you're saying is, okay, if I've got um, a certain amount of expenses, I need 25 times that in a portfolio across all of my liquid investments or liquid savings vehicles. Um, I need 25 times my annual expenses in that portfolio that I'm going to draw down from 4% every year. And in doing so, you will very likely end up with way more wealth than you um, than you started with, actually. And only a small percentage of the time, according to the Trinity study that was done, and this is just for stock market investing, um, you add Bitcoin into the mix and it, and it uh, changes the calculation a little bit more. Um, and actually maybe you're, you're very conservative with 4%, but, um, you get to a place where you can draw down on that portfolio over time, 4% a year, and you never run out of money essentially. And it's able to fund all of the things that you would like to do within your retirement. So you have to start with that foundation in place. What do you want your life to look like? And what is that going to cost you? And then from there, you can calculate what you think you might need for that portfolio to sustain that expense level. Um, the other way to think about it is, okay, you still need to start thinking about how much you're going to um, spend. But then in Bitcoin terms, like what is, what is the time frame that you want your Bitcoin portfolio to last? And maybe a good framework here is like 100 years. So if there's 100 years of um, your Bitcoin portfolio 
needing to last you, then maybe you can denominate your retirement in Bitcoin terms. And if you get to a place where selling 1% of your Bitcoin every year will at least cover the expenses that you need in retirement, then your Bitcoin portfolio will last you at least 100 years. Now, that's assuming that the value of Bitcoin is not drastically going up and you can sell way less than that 1% at some point in time. Uh, that's probably what's going to happen. Um, so if you still stick to that plan and you're going to sell it you know, 1% every 100 years, obviously like your kids are going to be involved in this. So you got to think about that. But if you're going to sell down 1% and have your Bitcoin stack last over 100 years, well, that 1% is going to grow in purchasing power drastically. So maybe by year 20, you're still selling 1%, but now you're able to avoid uh, afford this like massive mansion that you never even considered because that 1% is worth so much more. Um, so if that's the case, maybe 2% is a better is a better feel for like having the portfolio last 100 years. Um, I, I, I'm rambling a little bit here, but the point is, is that um, there's a lot of variables associated with like what the valuation of Bitcoin is going to be, what is the purchasing power going to be. So my approach is always to be very conservative um, and then to uh, save as much and uh, as, as I can to get to that goal. And then then you can adjust as things go. If you've got a conservative goal, you hit that goal, you can adjust as things progress and as the valuation changes. And if you're like way out pacing your spending, then, you know, enjoy your life a little bit more and spend a little bit more or, um, or not like leave a bigger nest egg for your kids and, and have that Bitcoin stretch out a little bit further. And the same thing goes for a stock market, right? Like if you've got a portfolio of the, the index because you've saved it up, and you don't want to take the tax hit or whatever, like the same uh, calculus is can be employed. It's just that um, you're not going to get the same type of growth that you do, at least at this point in, in history, uh, with the stock market as you are with Bitcoin. Yeah, and I love what you said uh, in the beginning with, with not wanting to retire in a traditional sense because this is the best form of retirement you can have is just a job or a, a, a thing that you're doing that you get paid for actually that actually fulfills you and actually makes you happy and you don't want to get away from that you're just like happy to do that and at some point you might scale it down to net 40 hours or 60 hours a week maybe like just 10 hours or 20 hours whatever the the scaling is from that but I think that's the, the when best you hit that financial independence number, when you hit that financial independence number and you can actually like not worry about where your income is coming from, then you can do whatever you want to do. I would encourage you to do something productive and continue to like, you know, enjoy being productive in society and you can draw an income there that can supplement this and maybe allow you to not sell as much of your Bitcoin or your portfolio as you need to in order to cover that expense, like continue to add value to the world, please. We, we need your brain power here. We need your, your effort here. Society, your, your grandkids will thank you. Take a low time preference view. Um, but, you know, but man, isn't it nice to get to a position where you don't have to worry about, is this paycheck going to come in? And what is that? What does that mean to my mortgage payment or whatever the case is, right? That's what the fire movement is about is, is getting you to that place as, as quickly and as early on in life where you have these opportunities and options that you don't have if you, um, if you don't yet have that financial independence. And I think the people that are in the position that they don't have to work, but they want to work, those are the ones who really can contribute in a major way to society because they have the the, in, the the really intrinsic motivation to do something, even though they don't really need to. And this is like a, a really cool uh, place to be. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, really cool that, that we ended up with that kind of conclusion to, to that topic. And one thing that is really important, and you're also doing on, on, in, on Unchained, uh, when you have Bitcoin is actually how to store the Bitcoin. <laughs> and the topic that I just got in last year in, because uh, last year was like a major educational year for me in, in Bitcoin, um, is multi-signature. Uh, and Let's let's talk a little bit about why multi-signature is so important and maybe also like 
what number of, of Bitcoin or what number of, of, of US dollar equivalent of Bitcoin does multi-signature actually make sense? Because for me, there's always like levels to it. If you have only 10 euros in Bitcoin, <laughs> even self-custody maybe does not make sense. Just leave it on exchange. And when you hit like maybe a thousand euros, then you can move it to one wallet. Uh, with like just one key and at, at one point at what point you have to have like a, a multi-signature solution yeah it's it's different for everybody and i think there's a threshold of materiality that you need to determine for yourself um but the way that i typically answer that question when clients or prospective clients are asking is would you be losing a massive amount of sleep for this bitcoin that you've accumulated um if it just went away and if you lost it um, do you plan on, is it a material amount to you? And do you plan on passing it down to your family? <clears throat> and if, if you answer both of those questions, yes, then multi-signature is basically a must have, right? Um, the reason is because you need to be thinking about, like you get all of these benefits from holding your own keys. Um, you get autonomy, you get true financial independence in like a very strict sense of the word when you actually control your money and your account at a bank can't be summarily executed. Um, when you need to be traveling around the world, you can take your wealth with you um, and, and you know, not have it kind of shut off. You, you're truly financially independent there. Um, but you also need to take that responsibility very seriously because the only thing that will allow Bitcoin to move that you own is signatures from valid set of private keys. And the traditional way of doing this is with a single key that protects the Bitcoin, but that creates a single point of failure. So you have full unilateral control over the Bitcoin, but there are a lot of times when you might make one mistake and risk losing the Bitcoin. Um, the dreaded $5 wrench attack you know, can, can happen when somebody puts a gun to your head and says, give me your Bitcoin and you, it's pretty easy for you to do that. And, and what are you going to do if they, if, if that scenario happens and you've got the Bitcoin right in your house, like you're probably going to give it to them. And so, um, by introducing fault tolerance into your custody model, you now make the barrier for losing the Bitcoin or having, uh, somebody steal it from you so much greater. Uh, it builds resilience into your setup so that you can hold on to a material amount of Bitcoin for a very long time and makes the succession planning process much easier. Um, the way that we approach this at Unchained is by using multi-signature functionality such that there are three keys protecting the Bitcoin and any two out of the three of those are needed to move the Bitcoin. Um, generally speaking, our clients control two out of the three of those and Unchained controls a third so that you still retain unilateral control over the Bitcoin, but you've eliminated any kind of single point of failure. If something happens to one of those two keys that you're controlling, that you're keeping in two different geographic locations, you have not lost the Bitcoin. Again, that fault tolerance is built in and Unchained holds that third key as a professional services firm to not only guide you through setting this up and understanding how it works and be there for any kind of technical questions that you might have going forward, um, but as a recovery mechanism, if something were to happen to one of those two keys or if something happens to you. So this model, this collaborative custody model, this multi-sig model lends itself very well to succession planning because you actually can provide a copy of one of those two keys that you're controlling to an estate attorney, uh, an executor of your will, um, a trustee, a family member, somebody who you are putting in charge of helping your family with a Bitcoin if something happens to you, but you're not putting them in a position where they can run off with the funds. They can't make one mistake and lose it because there is no single point of failure there. And so multi-sig and this collaborative custody model is really a beautiful blend of the trade-offs of making sure that while you're alive, you can retain full control over the Bitcoin and unilaterally spend it. And you don't have any reliance on, on Unchained be, even being around in order to access the Bitcoin, but also having a plan in place in case you make a mistake, in case somebody knocks on your door, or in case something happens to you, um, for, for your family to get access to the Bitcoin and that, that inheritance and that succession planning, again, we build everything for uh, a very low time preference approach. Um, and 
having this like native functionality in Bitcoin and, and then being able to make that available to our clients is a huge part of what attracts people to us and, and to this model. And then if you're a business, if you're a corporation, you should be thinking about single points of failure there as well, right? Ultimately, there's always going to be some small group of people that has like the, the keys to the kingdom in terms of managing finances. And there are various control mechanisms that are put in place with corporations or with, um, you know, medium sized businesses or even small businesses with just two partners. Um, but you can protect the movement of Bitcoin by using multi-sig and completely eliminating a single point of failure there and then putting in some approval workflows and, and other things on top of that to, to make that process much more transparent, much more controllable and um, make sure that your business is resilient to any kind of issues that are doing there. And if you still don't feel comfortable holding keys and having unilateral control over the Bitcoin, or perhaps you can't do that, multi-sig um, lends itself to bring multiple custodians or multiple people into the mix that, um, again, eliminates a single point of failure and has no single institution maybe in in control of the Bitcoin or in a position where if they made one mistake, the Bitcoin would be lost. So we call this multi-institutional custody or delegated key management. Um, so our clients do have the ability to just maybe hold one key out of the three. They're giving up unilateral control, um, but if Unchained holds the second key and another independent uh, institution holds the third key, they, um, they gain some resiliency perhaps in that succession planning process where they there's no possible way that they could make any series of mistakes and lose the Bitcoin. And then you're trusting an institution to act in your stead there. There's some serious trade-offs there, of course, right? Like there's no substitute for self-custody, but some of our clients opt for that model because uh, they value the uh, institutional key agent relationship a little bit more highly than they trust themselves and their family to be able to manage this thing. So ultimately it's, it's based off of your decision-making process. And we've got this uh, gradient of options available to our clients to be able to get to a place where they're comfortable. Amazing. That's a great insights. And I saw uh, just a couple of minutes before the podcast, before we started on Twitter, do you send a post out with like 10 tips for beginners, something like for multi-signature? I, I, yeah. didn't read, I, I just saw it uh, on my, on my feet before I, <laughs> I jumped on the call. I, I pulled up a, an old blog post that uh, my friend Tyler Campbell, who um, it, he is the head of our custody solutions, our custody support team here, um, brilliant guy. Um, is is so well versed in Bitcoin private keys and multi sig and all this stuff, and he's been around Unchained about as long as I have, maybe a little bit longer. Um, and he put this article together, just talking about like some things that you need to know when you are dealing with with multi sig, um, and and a lot of it is basics around just key management. You know, you can. Uh, you can port your private keys from one device to another, like things are built in an interoperable way, like that kind of thing. Uh, so go, yeah, go check out that, that quick thread there. Mm, really, really cool. Perfect. Um, before we come to the end routine of the, the uh, podcast, I'm curious about uh, two more questions. And the first is, what are you most excited about in the Bitcoin community in the coming months, years, uh, whatever you want to take it? What am I most excited about? Uh, I think, this is kind of a lame answer, but I'm just excited about the 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 exposure that Bitcoin is going to get over the next few years. Like I've been around for multiple cycles and I've seen this play out. This is the first cycle that I've been working in Bitcoin. Uh, this is the first cycle where I think like a large amount of my friends and family like know that I work in Bitcoin, know that I'm like a huge proponent there. And I think this is the first cycle where we just get like this massive wave of adoption, uh, not only from retail, but from the, the institutional side. And the price is going to go insane. Um, and it's going to be really fun to see people actually start to take Bitcoin much more seriously. Like all of the, the, the foundation is set there for this, uh, the next couple of years to really bring Bitcoin into the national psyche. It's going to be a topic, it looks like, in the U.S. presidential election. That's going to be really interesting to see how, how it plays out. But all of this is just bullish for awareness of Bitcoin. And what Bitcoin really needs more than anything is for awareness to go up. 
because anybody who is aware of Bitcoin um, is going to eventually do a little bit of research. They're eventually going to get a little bit of exposure. They're eventually going to start to see the value of it, or it's just going to be around them to a place where they can't ignore it. And the the first part of Bitcoin adoption, I think for every individual or every organization is, okay, I, I just can't ignore this thing anymore, right? Once you realize that you can't ignore it anymore, the next step is that you start doing a little bit of research and you start to understand it. And when you start to understand it, then it becomes something that you're interested in. And once you're interested in it, then it becomes something, uh, assuming you continue down that path, that is like something that's imperative that you get exposure to. And once it's uh, once it's imperative that you get exposure to it, then it becomes like this idyllic thing that dominates your life <laughs> until you obsess over it enough where the entire world around you is is adopting it right so like that it's it's a mind virus and the the one thing that a mind virus needs is hosts and the only way that it gets hosts is through awareness and we're we're just going to have this massive wave of awareness coming over the next couple of years and i'm so envy of uh, america that it's already a topic at the elections because I'm, of course, I'm in Austria, I'm in the EU, I'm uh, seeing the EU election coming uh, through. There is no word about Bitcoin, about crypto, about anything like that. Uh, when it comes to the topic of inflation, when it comes to the topic that things get more expensive, oh, there's war in the Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's that's why we have inflation right now, uh, and and that's I'm like a little bit envy that I'm even listening to really small candidates that are probably not making like the one percent candidates, uh, and even those are not even 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 coming close to the topic of of Bitcoin. I have I had one co candidate who said he wants to go back to hard currency, but he said not gold. He di did not say Bitcoin. He said the old fiat currency of Austria, <laughs> the, oh, the one yes. we had before, uh, which was hilarious. So I'm, I'm a little bit envy of the- Was it connected against. to gold? I'm guessing it was a gold backed currency. Yes, it was uh, more connected to gold <laughs> than, than before it called a uh, shilling. Uh, mm -hmm. We had it till, 2001, 2002 or something like that, uh, till the euro came along. Uh, but I actually don't know a lot about, about uh, the history of the, the Austrian, uh, uh, currency, but yeah, it's, it's, it, it was definitely better than the euro right now. Um, the, the last question before the end routine, uh, what are you currently, uh, passionate about besides Bitcoin? Like, what are you into reading, learning, uh, besides the whole Bitcoin thing? Hmm. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about, um, psychology and, you know, I'm, I'm in sales. So a lot of like thought process and conversational things around, um, helping to develop relationships with people and, um, kind of enhance my sales process and that kind of thing. So I'm definitely interested in that. Um, I, uh, I play as much golf as I'm able to. So golf is something that, uh, kind of operate, uh, uh, occupies my psyche, uh, to a large extent. And like, if I'm scrolling on X, uh, it's like 90% Bitcoin, but there's a little bit of golf mixed in there as well. Uh, and, and, uh, trying to, to build my game up. I have two young kids, so it's very difficult for me to get out on, on too much of an occasion. Um, but since we're on the topic, I got to give a shout out to Bitcoin golf championship, um, for, for all the golfers who are out there listening to, to Robin's podcast, uh, if you're going to Nashville, on July 24th, which is Wednesday, um, before the conference starts, uh, the Bitcoin golf championship is going to happen there. Um, it's just some plebs coming out to have a good time and meet, meet other Bitcoiners, uh, over golf. Like there's this really cool, uh, overlap between golf as a low time preference sport and Bitcoin as a low time preference money. Um, and so I, I, I like to, uh, you know, kind of expand awareness of that overlap there. And it's going to be just a fun event. So go check it out. I love it. I love it. Unfortunately, Bitcoin Prague uh, does not have it. Uh, the end routine actually is about uh, that very topic. Uh, what is your favorite? Like we have an end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest uh, without knowing who the next guest actually is. Uh, and the question from the previous guest for you is, what is your favorite uh, Bitcoin meetup or conference? Oh, um, I'm going to have to say TabConf, the Atlanta Bitcoin conference. Um, so I live in Atlanta, so it's nice and convenient for me, but I've always had 
a lot of interest in understanding the technical sides of the way that Bitcoin works. Um, I don't hold a candle to a lot of people, of course, uh, but I've always found it fascinating. Um, I run my own node. I, you know, obviously, you know, use my own keys and that kind of thing. But I also like to really explore the the technical ins and outs. And the Atlanta Bitcoin conference is very different than other conferences. It's very much technically focused. Um, a lot of the devs around Bitcoin love to come to Atlanta for this conference because it's very much high signal around the technical aspects of things. And so I always try to make it there for at least a, a day or two of the conference and meet some of those technical folks and really broaden my understanding of some of the key topics that people are um, are really working on, some of the new developments that are taking place, some of the old developments that are evolving. Um, it's just fascinating to me. So I'm, I'm going to give that one uh, a shout out. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and before we uh, let you go, where can people uh, ask you questions, reach out to you if they're interested in Unchained in the services, if they're interested in you and in, in some thing, something you said, where can uh, they ask you questions? Yeah, I'm on Twitter and X uh, at TS underscore HODL, uh, H-O-D-L. And I've got a personal website, traysellers.com. Uh, so go check that out. Uh, I've got an article that I wrote, uh, Bitcoin is fire friendly. So if you're interested in exploring the the overlap between Bitcoin and fire and, and that conversation that we were having, you know, please go check that out. Uh, and let me know what you think. Um, and then, yeah, definitely go check out Unchained, unchained.com. Um, you know, we are we are a Bitcoin integrated financial services company. We help our clients to acquire and secure Bitcoin. Um, and really maximize its value. Um, we've got a retirement account, a Bitcoin IRA that's available in the U.S. Um, and so for we, we, we certainly are a little bit more focused on the U.S. So for your international li listeners, um, the custody options are, are absolutely available. We have the best service uh, on the planet when it comes to uh, this type of thing. But um, the, the financial services that we offer around that are built on this collaborative custody model are uh, really only available in the U.S. Um, but for your, your U.S. listeners, definitely come check us out. Yeah, uh, actually, as I'm European, I have actually... 50% American listeners from the United States. And I think uh, Canada is also really big up there. And uh, I think second is UK or something like that. But mostly I actually- Absolutely. From, well, we, from yeah, we, we, help, we help clients all over the world to secure their Bitcoin using multi-sig, using this collaborative custody model, and really think through that succession planning. And we've got service levels that can um, you know meet your needs to the extent that you need to, uh, whether that be just a, a quick onboarding call and, and some general support going Going forward, or if you want somebody dedicated to you, uh, we have a program called Unchained Signature. It's a really nice program to allow people to get as much time as they need with an expert there to, um, you know, take them down that succession rabbit hole, uh, take them down the the sovereign recovery rabbit hole, and and any other educational um, bits of Bitcoin that you'd like to explore. And then we do exclusive events, both virtual and in person throughout the year for our signature clients. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other benefits as well. So definitely come check that out. If you're, if you're interested in that kind of like high touch white glove service on an ongoing basis. Perfect. And thank you, Trey, for, for being on and for everyone, uh, listening and watching. I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Thank you, Robin. Really enjoyed it.